Well, good evening. It's great to be with you all tonight. Um, I love being able to travel and uh, see different faces, see different congregations, and full of people who, um, you know, are longing to hear the Word of God. And that's, that's something that I think more and more about as I continue to preach. And I've, I've done this for a couple years now, but as I preach at different locations, seeing soul seeing people who just hunger for God's word is so cool to me who are willing to uh, you know have guest speakers come in especially young ones like myself and uh, I know uh, a lot of people here took a big risk I mean I'm sure you all don't know how good of a preacher I am Um, Emmy talks really good about me so I'm sure that helped but um, you know seeing people who are willing to listen to God's word no matter how uh, good the public speaker is or you know however much experience or talent they have is really cool um, I want to talk for a little bit tonight about our feet, um, which is a weird way to start, I know. I've had to think a lot about how I start this sermon, just because it can be so weird. Um, so I, I want to start with an illustration. Um, and, and to begin, I want us to think about the mind of a child. The mind of a child is very pure, and a lot of times they can be brutally honest. Um, I have a couple nieces who have called my father fat. Um, just because that's how, you know, they, they see somebody who's larger and they, oh, you're fat. And, and you know, that, that's how pure a child is. Another part of, of the child's purity um, is their desire to make you happy. And, um, yeah, and, you know, see the beauty in the world around them. Uh, one time I was walking down the street with one of my nieces and there was a shattered glass bottle on the side of the road. And she ran ahead of me and threw her arms out and said, <gasps> diamonds and started scooping them up. And I said, no, 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 stop. <laughs> they see beauty in everything. And I can make them a, a hideous drawing of a horse or something. I'm, I'm not the best artist. And, you know, they're like, oh, no, Uncle Noah, draw us a horse. And I'll, I'll do my best. <gasps> it's beautiful, right? That's what, it's, oh, it's amazing. I love it. In 10 years, they will not love it. But right now, they love it. You know, it's, it's everything to them. They think it's beautiful. Adults are not that way. We can't really see the beauty in something in which there is no beauty. We see something ugly, it's ugly, right? That's just how it is. We may not be as brutally honest as a child and say that, but in our minds, uh, that's, that's not pretty. Think about feet. The way that we use our feet, um, they don't always look beautiful, right? I mean, from an adult mind, we don't look at feet and think, wow, beautiful, right? Especially somebody who likes to hike. I I really like to hike. I like to go on walks in the forest and that sort of thing. Um, And my feet afterwards would not be described as beautiful by most people in the world, probably even children. Um, That's just not how they look after we've been walking around in dirt, mud, you know, sticks, leaves, grass, whatever. But God's mind doesn't work like our human minds. The things that make sense to God don't always make sense to us. My mom used to say, God's math is not the same as man's math. The way he calculates different things in our lives it doesn't, doesn't work out. It doesn't make sense to us. And this is one of those cases. Turn over with me to Isaiah chapter 52. In Isaiah chapter 52, God is talking about how he is going to redeem his people back. They've sinned, they've messed up, and they're going to be punished for that. But God is spreading this message of encouragement, this message of the the gospel. It's good news. I will bring my people back. I will restore them. In verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 52, he says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The first person who pointed this verse out to me, his name was Dan Kane. I don't know how many people here know him. Uh, He's currently in Sierra Leone in uh, West West Africa uh, preaching. And West Africa, again, much like hiking in the forest, your feet are not beautiful. And he pointed the scripture out to me and he said, God sees my feet as beautiful. Does he see your feet as beautiful? And that's a question that I want us to be asking ourselves. Does God see our feet as beautiful? When God looks at our character, who we are, does God see somebody who exemplifies this passage, who is taking his good news out to the world around them, the people that need to hear, hey, God has redeemed you. God has bought you back. You are dead to him in sin. 
You have been taken into bondage to Satan. And the Lord has redeemed you. That's the message that we have been assigned to give to people. Are we doing that? And thus does God see our feet as beautiful. You see, throughout the Bible, God will use this idea of, of feet to depict various things that are important to him. You know, just think about the way that he describes our, our journey as Christians. Journey, for instance. Uh, the way or a path, right, that we walk. Countless places in scripture. And, and the opposite of following God, he talks about as things like stumbling or turning aside to the left and the right. Things that have to do with walking, right? That's the common illustration that he uses. How we use our feet is directly correlated to what kind of Christian we are. How we live our lives in the eyes of God. I want to point out some things tonight in Scripture that God wants us to do with our feet. And we can ask ourselves, am I doing those things? And thus, does God see my feet as beautiful? We learn a lot about our lives as Christians by determining what things are important to God and figuring out if we're doing those things. It's the easiest way to, to, to grade something, right? I mean, that's what a grading scale is. You say, this is the right answer. If this person did not put that answer, they're wrong, right? They get an F. This person, oh, they put that answer. They get an A. That's how we figure this out. We look at God's word. We say, what does God want me to do? Am I doing it? And that's how we can grade ourselves. Isaiah chapter 52 in verse 7 is, is quoted in Romans chapter 10, the passage that was read for us before. Um, God expresses how upset he is um, by Jerusalem's sin. In the first several verses of this chapter, he's describing you know, how, how much torture they're going to have to endure, the things that they're going to have to go through because they messed up. But you see, 52 is not a chapter of, wow, this is so terrible. Oh man, Israel's in such a bad spot. Jerusalem has no hope. No, it's a message of joy for those who will make it known that God's salvation is going to come, that God will redeem them. Now this messenger, Isaiah, he's the one that was so quick to volunteer back in Isaiah chapter 6. If you remember that story, God appears to Isaiah in a vision and, and Isaiah, taken aback, says, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. Right? He, he, he's sinned a lot. And so an angel touches his mouth with a coal from the fire, and he's cleansed. And right after that, God says, man, who am I going to send? Who's going to take my message to this people? Well, if you're Isaiah, your mouth has just been cleansed by the Lord. Yeah, I'll sign up. Right? I, I've just been healed by God. I, that sounds great to me, to do whatever God wants me to do. Absolutely. And that's Isaiah's mindset in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. But the message that he's delivering there is not a good message. It's not like Isaiah 52. The message he's delivering is the message prior to Isaiah 52. The message he's been told to deliver is, you guys have messed up. You guys have sinned, and God is done with it. He is over it. You are going to be taken into bondage. You are going to have to serve another nation. Your lives are not going to be your own. That's the message that Isaiah had to preach to this people. A message of no hope. A message, it's too late. You've messed it up. That's Isaiah's message in the beginning of the book. And at even that message, Isaiah says, here, send me. Yeah, I'll do it. The message that we have, the message that we've been told to proclaim, is so much better. This message in Isaiah 52, this is our message. Peace, glad tidings of good things, salvation. Our God reigns. That's the message that we're taking into the world today. That we, as a people, have been sold into bondage to sin, to Satan, and yet we have been redeemed by our Lord. We don't have to go and teach this message of misery and sadness. We can proclaim good news, the gospel, to people. And yet we're so much more hesitant than Isaiah. Isaiah did whatever God needed to do because he realized that God had healed him, had purified his mouth. With the realization that God has purified us, has saved us, do we see that same responsibility to go out and to serve him? Turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul describes the armor of God. Several elements to this armor 
relate to our Christian lives, things like faith and salvation in the Spirit. We're going to read a little bit here in Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 10. And I want you to, to listen for things that have to do with our feet. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And there's, there's so much more that we can explore in that passage. But, but did you see the emphasis that he put? In the power of the Lord, with his might, we can stand. And what are we standing on? What are we shodding our feet with? It's this preparation to take good news, to preach a message of peace to people in this world who need to hear that. People who are lost in sin, people who have no hope, like the people in the book of Isaiah, to preach to them a message of, you have been redeemed. God wants to save you. That's the message that we can give. We're wrestling with these principalities and powers, and God says, you know what the best way to get out of that is, to withstand that? Prepare yourself to preach the gospel, because if we're going out into the world, into the world that Satan controls, and we're shedding light in this dark world, that defeats Satan. Think about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, right? When, when he's confronted by Satan in the wilderness, how does he defend against him? How does he wrestle with those principalities and powers? He quotes scripture. He has prepared himself to preach the gospel of peace, and that makes him ready to withstand the devil. It's the same for us. We seek ways to withstand Satan in our lives, we need to prepare ourselves to preach the word to other people. If we, in our own minds, know what God wants us to do and we're doing it, it's going to make our lives looking to God so much easier. By preparing ourselves to teach others, our faith will grow. Our faith will become stronger. And our ability to defeat Satan will grow more powerful. Again, all through the power of the Lord's might. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, Moses has fled the land of Egypt after Pharaoh has found out that he has killed a man, an Egyptian. And Moses flees to the land of Midian, and he meets this woman, Zipporah, and he, he gets in tight with her father, and he's you know, helping shepherd his sheep. And by the way, that's a message to uh, people who are looking to marry somebody's daughter. Do good things for the father-in-law. That's really helpful. Zach. Um, just thought of that off the top of my head. Um, but, but Moses is shepherding the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro, and, and he sees this bush that's burning but not being burned up. It's on fire, but it's not being destroyed. And a voice comes to him and says, take the sandals off your feet because the place you are standing is holy ground. You see, the place where God is is always holy. That's who's speaking to him. It's the great I am. It's Yahweh. Wherever God is, that place must be holy. And what we'll come to find out is that having dirty feet is representative of having a dirty lifestyle, having a worldly lifestyle. For instance, in the limited commission, when Jesus sends out his apostles in teams of two, he says, when you go into a city and they accept you, great. If you go into a city and they reject you, you leave the city and at the gate, you take the shoes off your feet and you shake out the dust to show them that the worldliness, the dirtiness of that city is not a part of my message. It's not a part of who I am. I'm leaving that disgusting worldliness here, that unwillingness to accept the gospel that God has sent us to give. Dirt is representative of worldliness. The bronze laver outside the tabernacle was directly outside the door and the priests before they could enter into the holy place of the tabernacle, had to take off their shoes and wash their hands and their feet away from the, the dirt. And they didn't put their shoes back on. They went into the temple with clean feet. And then they came back out, back into the world. 
Again, where God is, God's dwelling place was a tabernacle. Where God is must be holy. We can't take dirty worldliness into where God is. Are our feet holy? Are our feet clean? And again, that's not our literal feet. But are we a worldly people? Are we like the world around us? Do our shoes have dirt on them, if you will? Or have we cleaned them off? Have we taken off our shoes because our bodies are God's temple? We realize that the place where we are right now is holy ground. Not this structure, this church building, but us, this group of people. We are holy in the eyes of God. We need to act that way. We can't bring worldliness before our Lord. <clears throat> Finally, I want to talk about service a little bit. In John chapter 13, and this may be the, where your brains went. I know it's where mine when I started thinking about beautiful feet. In John chapter 13, verses 1 through 11, they've just eaten dinner. And Jesus rises from the table, and he girds himself with a towel, and he fills a basin with water, and he goes from apostle to apostle, and he washes their feet. I have some shoes and some socks, and so while my feet are probably still not beautiful right now, they're not disgusting. Just take my word for it. In that day and age, specifically the apostles, you know what, back in that limited commission, you know what Jesus told them? You don't need to have two pairs of sandals. One pair of sandals is good enough for you. They had one pair of sandals, no socks. I can't say this definitively, but I am guessing that their feet were not super nice. Walking around Galilee area all day, salt, dirt, right, twigs, bugs, all this stuff, in just a pair of sandals. And they're fishermen too. I don't, Again, I, I can't say 100%, but I don't think that they had the prettiest feet. Jesus, the Savior of humanity, the creator of the world, got down on his hands and knees, and he washed his disciples' feet. And yet James talks about our lifestyle today. In the book of James, he says that oftentimes when people come to us and they say, hey, I'm hungry. And I need a place to stay. We tell them, be warm and filled. Go in peace. Good luck with that. I'll be praying for you, brother. You know, I'm sure that'll, I'm sure that'll all work out for you. Just trust in God. When you have the things to help them, you have the ability to be hospitable to them, to give them what they need. And yet we don't do that. Us as Christians, as people who have been saved by God, Jesus says in John 13, I have given this to you as an example of what you should do to others. In the book of Timothy, this is specifically something that widows are res responsible of doing too. If widows want to be taken care of by the church, it says that they should have washed other people's feet. You see, the lifestyle of our Lord, his mindset was not high and mighty. It was not holier than thou. It was not, I'm too good for blah, blah, blah. But our culture says we are. The United States of America says, I'm too good to do that. I have freedom. I have rights. I get to live my life however I want. No, our responsibility is to take ourselves from a lofty position and put ourselves in a low enough position that we can see somebody's feet who need to be washed. And we can get on top of that. That was the mindset of our Lord. He went from his throne in heaven to underneath the table so that he could wash our feet. That's your Savior. That's my Savior. Is that me? Is that the mindset that I have? Think about some of the layers of this. Again, you know, not, not pretty feet. These aren't my feet that he's washing. I had to, one time for Christmas, give my father a foot massage. I didn't love that, if I'm being honest. But at least, again, he was wearing shoes and socks. They weren't totally disgusting. These are not the nicest feet. And he was my father, somebody I love. Enough. 
Think about some of the people that Jesus was having to wash their feet. I imagine a scenario where maybe Jesus has finished washing Bartholomew's feet or Andrew or somebody, and he starts on the next disciple and he looks up, and as he's washing them, he's looking up into the face of Judas, his betrayer, the person that sold him for 30 pieces of silver to the men seeking to kill him. That's the kind of people whose feet Jesus was willing to wash. Sometimes I think we take the verse, love your enemies, and we just kind of think, don't hate your enemies, right? Just, oh, well, you know, if I, you know, at least show them love to the point where it's heaping, you know, coals on their head, then we're good, right? Jesus' version of love your enemies was washing their feet. That's amazing to me. Turn over to John chapter 13. Just going to read a couple verses here. <clears throat> Starting in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. Think about that term, sent. What is our responsibility today? Physically, yes, I think that we should be willing to help each other do the lowly things. But think about what we just talked about, having dirty feet represents worldliness. What is our responsibility? It's to clean other people's feet from the worldliness of, of dirt, the, the, the sin of dust. Right? Our responsibility is to go out into the world and wash people's feet, to make them holy in the eyes of God. That's what we're sent to do. And Jesus did that. Jesus came down from his place on heaven and he cleaned other people's feet. Literally, and much more importantly, in a spiritual sense. Again, like Isaiah, do we see that responsibility for ourselves? This is Jesus' words. We are not greater than him. From the right hand of God to Judas's feet. That's the journey that Jesus made. And I'm not willing to talk to my next door neighbor about the thing that, that saved me, that saved my eternal soul, the man whose blood redeemed me forever, that glorious message that I have, I'm not willing to take to the people around me. To me, that says a lot about our lives as Christians. We talked about at the beginning of the sermon, this idea that seeing what God says in his word and a realization that I'm not living it, that should prick me. God's word is a sharp two-edged sword, right? It, it divides me in half, and it shows me where I've messed up, where I'm not doing what God wants me to do. And for me, it has shown me that I am not willing to put myself at other people's feet. That I think I'm good enough because I have the message of God, I have God's gospel, but I'm too good to take it to other people whether it's a pride issue, whether we're just nervous to do it, whether we don't care, it doesn't matter. Whatever our motivation is to not take God's word to people, I assure you it is not worth it. We sing a song sometimes, um, You Never Mention Him to Me, I think it's called. I hate that song. And it gives me chills. Thinking about seeing somebody in heaven who I could have taken God's word to, who I could have given salvation to, whose feet I could have cleaned. And the realization that I just thought I was too good. I just thought they weren't worth it. That, that freaks me out. That, that is terrifying. And so maybe tonight, you have a realization that you have not washed yourself clean of the worldliness around you. That your feet are dirty, that the shoes that you're wearing still show signs of the places in the world that you've been, the things that you've done. 
You need to change that. You need to come to God and let him wash your feet. Or maybe your feet are clean, but they're not beautiful. Because you have not been upon the mountains, taking God's word to the lost. Showing those around you that even though they are in bondage to sin, God is offering them redemption. God wants to buy them back. We have an incredible message. We have to be stronger in the power of the Lord's might, right? Not our own. In the Lord's might to take that message into the world and save those around us. If any of us can be helpful to you in any way, in, in prayer, in, in guidance, in ways that we can help you to go out and, and take this message to the world, please let me know. Please let one of the men here know. We need to be focused on the will of God. We can help you in any way.